Turn your Bibles, Mark chapter 8. Man, I'm excited, pumped about this particular passage. Finally getting to this fullness of what we're looking to do over the past several weeks. We've been in the book of Mark as a whole to know and follow Jesus. But we've been in this short little series between chapters 6 through 8 because they belong to one another. There's a progression in them that we want to see because 6 began with a moment of unbelief where they were, people were offended at Jesus. Chapter 8 is going to conclude with the great confession of Peter. And then a call to not just confess him with our mouths, but to confess him with our lives. What does it look like to truly follow Jesus? That's what we're going to take a look at in the scripture this morning. That's what God is going to clearly define. And I'm telling you, this is one of the most pinnacle, important passages when it comes to a follower of Jesus. Verse number 34, which we will eventually get to this morning, is one of the keys to know and follow Jesus. And I don't want you to miss him this morning. I want you to be ready because there is something called the cost of discipleship. There is a call and a command of the Lord to where he gets in front of us and says, are you serious? Do you belong to me? Is your life gonna reflect me or is it gonna reflect the things of this world? That's what's going to be standing in front of us this morning. And I want you to be ready to hear from the Lord and be ready to respond to him. So let's begin our journey. In the honor of God's word, would you stand with me this morning as we begin in verse number 27 in chapter 8 of the book of Mark. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Pray with me this morning. Lord Jesus, are our minds on you? You know it. Are we following you? You know it. Lord Jesus, open up our hearts and our minds to the fullness of who you are. Help us not to miss, help us not take another step that's not in line and honoring of you. Lord Jesus, call us home this morning. May we come out of that tomb of sin in this world and Lord Jesus, come alive in Christ and become a great follower and confessor of the Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray that you have your way with us this morning. Lord, there is no way we can hold back. There's no way we can remain the same. No one can come into your presence and remain the same. Father, we pray this morning, Lord, that you will do a mighty eternal work and we will see you right before our eyes. And we pray for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Let's begin this journey with the great confession in verse number 27. In chapter 8 as a whole, there's been a couple key things that have taken place. Remember the feeding of the 5,000 that already came in the book of Mark? Well, in chapter 8 is the feeding of the 4,000. At the end of that feeding, once again, he asked the disciples, don't you get this? Do you not understand? And so realize, leading up to verse number 27, Not everything is guaranteed. Not everything is fully disclosed. Are they understanding? Are they getting it? Are we getting it? Who is 
Jesus. So let's begin back in verse number 27. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? Just a key question. Who are people saying that I am? What's the chatter that's taking place out there? And they respond. Some say John the Baptist and other Elijahs and other ones, one of the prophets. What are they talking about? Now, you have to remember, why is he saying some people are saying he's John the Baptist? Why? Because Herod the king is paranoid. Earlier on in the book of Mark, Herod the king had beheaded John the Baptist. And his great fear was that John the Baptist was going to come back and haunt him, that John the Baptist was going to reappear. And so when Jesus is doing all these miracles, he, out of fear, thinks it's John the Baptist. And he begins spreading a rumor, John the Baptist, that's who Jesus is. He's John the Baptist. And some others say Elijah, someone who is making and preparing the way for the Lord or one of the prophets, just a good teacher, a man of God teaching about God. They're all missing it. They are looking in human terms. All of them are looking in just man-made type of descriptions. And that's when he gets to the heart of us. That question, this question for Peter, this question for the disciples, it is a question for every one of us in this room. But who do you say that I am? And Jesus using that great moniker from Exodus chapter 3, I am. Who do you say, I am, Peter? I've revealed myself. I've revealed myself to you. You should know. Hopefully you know who I am. And Peter gives the great confession. Take a look what he says. And he asked him, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Christ. Why is this the great confession? Because they are pointing specifically and waiting for a deliverer. They are looking for the anointed one. They're looking for the one who's going to come and rescue and to reestablish the kingdom. But in their minds, the kingdom of Israel and this world. But they got one thing right. He is the Christ. He is the deliverer. He is the anointed one. He is God incarnate. And he has shown up for us to deliver us. The Exodus was the greatest saving act of the Old Testament. This is the greatest saving act of the world, and they know who the deliverer is. Do we? Do we know who the deliverer is? Do we know who's the one that comes to rescue? Do we know who has the payment price? Do we know who has the power to free us from the bondage of sin? Do we know him. And here Peter gives the great confession, you are the Christ. He gets it right. But then he says, strictly tells him, don't tell anyone. Why? Because his time has not yet come. Take a look at the way he describes what's about to come in verse number 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man, that's who he is, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. This is about six months out from the cross. And he knows exactly what's going to take place. He knows exactly why he came. He knows exactly the price that has to be paid. Remember, he is the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. The scripture says, without the shedding of blood, there cannot be the forgiveness of sin. Jesus came not to set up an earthly kingdom, but to establish an eternal one. And he came to get his children, and we are his children. And he came to pay our price and to do what it takes to pay our price. And he knew that road was going to be of suffering and rejection and death. And then he talked about the resurrection, that he was going to rise again. And I love the scripture. He talked about it plainly. I mean, I call this just good old common sense. This is what we call country boy logic. I'm going to tell you the way it is. I don't want you to miss this. I don't want you to have a misunderstanding. Obviously, they got it. Because they didn't like what they heard. Remember, many prophecies in the Old Testament were about a crown, were about a great nation. And the disciples thought he, they were talking about an earthly kingdom, not an eternal one. 
And so when they hear rejection, when they hear suffering, when they hear death, that's not what they signed up for. That's what, not what they wanted. They wanted an earthly kingdom. They wanted to be recognized. They wanted power. And so what does Peter do? He just made the great confession. According to Matthew, Jesus said, I'm just about to, I'm going to establish the church through you, Peter. You are the rock and I'm going to build this church. I mean, Peter's feeling pretty good about himself. You know what I'm saying? He's like, man, I just got this. I got the right answer. By the way, I'm now infallible, right? Is that the way we feel? We get it right. Man, I got this right. And so he knows Jesus has got to be mistaken. Jesus, you, you got it wrong. Look what he does here in the scriptures. It says, and Peter took him aside. Listen to this. And began to rebuke him. Jesus. No, 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 no. Jesus, you don't got it. You don't have it right. You don't got it right, Jesus. It's not about suffering. It's about conquering. It's not about rejection. It's about fame. It's about you being great, Jesus. Don't. Don't go this way. Don't go down that road. There's a better road for you to go down. Here's how Jesus receives that rebuke. Verse number 33. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. That gets pretty honest, doesn't it? Calls him the accuser. Says you're the enemy. Satan's temptation in the wilderness has come back up again. Do you remember his temptation to Jesus? Jesus, here's all the kingdoms of the world. Crossless, suffer, not suffering. I mean, just bow down before me, worship me, and you can have it all without any price to be paid, without any suffering, without any rejection, without any death. Just worship me. And Peter is bringing the same temptation in front of Jesus as the enemy did. And he calls him Satan. Get behind me, Satan. And here's the key to the passage. Don't miss this. This is the whole key. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Do not miss this. Jesus knows what he's come for. And he's come to do the will of God, not man. Here's the question. Even in our most midst of our great confession, we can get things wrong. Are our minds set upon the things of God? Or are they set upon the things of man? What captures your heart? What do you daydream about? What is it that gets you so excited? The things of God, eternal kingdom things, or the things of this world? Because Jesus is about to set out a clarity about what it means to be Christ-centered, what it means to set your mind on the things of God, beginning in verse number 34. And this is a test for us. This is a way to evaluate for us. Do we belong to him? Are we living for him? Or is it possible that my mind and my heart is more set upon the things of man than the things of God? Are you ready? Here we go. Verse number 34. Ooh, you better memorize this verse. Here we go. And he called to him the crowd with his disciples and said to them, here's the key. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Four parts to this verse. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, number two. Take up his cross, number three, and follow me. Now here is the key to being Christ-centered, understanding what a kingdom perspective is all about. Because the kingdom is about life. Remember this. The world is about death. The kingdom of God is about the newness of life, this new creation that he created us to be. And I want you to hear up on the screen a quote. Let's begin with this guy named Aaron Coe, son of Norman Coe of our church. He writes in one of his books, The irony of God's kingdom is this. True fulfillment is found in sacrifice. True identity is found as we lose ourselves in Christ. And our deepest questions are answered outside of ourselves. I want you to see that as an overall picture because as we begin to break it down, 
Please hear, Jesus loves you, loves me, wants to free us. And so many times we miss the freedom that he so yearns for us to experience. And in fact, we remain enslaved with the things of this world instead of being free in Christ. And so let's begin to break it down. The very first phrase of this is, if anyone would come after me. This is a response. This is where it begins. Jesus reveals himself in his sovereignty. He allows man to have free will. And in his sovereignty and his free will, and the man, free will of man are operating simultaneously in this passage. And he has made himself known. He has come for us, established the path. But he says, if anyone would come after me, respond to him, believe in him, choose him. And the key is if anyone... I mean, this is an open invitation. This is open for us. We don't deserve this type of invitation. We don't deserve this kind of mercy and this kind of grace. But he opens up the doors for us and welcomes us in. Have you responded to Jesus? Have you believed in him? Are you a follower of Christ? Because he welcomes all. This is not, he's not going to turn the tables on you. He is not going to make fun of you. He is not going to reject you if you honestly and openly with contrition come before him. This is not, this is not Charlie Brown. I watched the whole Great Pumpkin again this week. Why? Because it's Halloween you're supposed to, right? Do you remember the scene in Charlie Brown where he gets the invitation to the party and he comes up dancing? I got an invitation. The first time I got an invitation. And Lucy says, oh, there were two lists, Charlie Brown. You are on the wrong list. Do you remember that moment? Do you remember the meanness? Do you remember that cutting? And I remember I watched him going, man, this is mean, right? Why am I watching this? All the kid gets is rocks, right? That's not the way Jesus operates. There's some of you in this room, you think you do not deserve to get into the kingdom. You're right. But he loves you. And he makes free way for you anyway. And he opens up an invitation. And he says, if anyone comes to me, it's open. He welcomes you. But there is a cost to discipleship. There is a cost, and that cost is we lay down our lives. As he laid down his life for us, we lay down our lives, and we pledge our full allegiance and loyalty to him and to no other. And that is described in the next three phrases that we have. First one is to deny himself. Now, this is a misunderstood phrase. The moment you hear that, to deny yourself, what happens automatically? We take a self-centered approach. All of a sudden, we've been thinking about my effort. We start thinking about our will. We start thinking about our decisions. And we start thinking about the things that we have to give up. And two things happen. We either look at the difficulty of giving things up, or we take pride in the things that we've given up. And we're not focused on Christ. In fact, we're focused upon ourselves. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his great book, The Cost of Discipleship, writes this about let him deny himself. He writes, to deny oneself is to be aware only of Christ and no more self, to see only him who goes before us and no more the road which is too hard for us. It's Jesus only. Because the moment we come to Christ, the moment we surrender to him, he calls upon us to deny ourselves in light of his glory and grace. It's amazing when we enter into a relationship with him and how great he becomes, how wonderful he is, how majestic he is, and in light of his glory, how the things of this world begin to fade, how they begin to lose the flavor in our mouths, our desires begin to change. And instead of looking at how difficult it is to deny ourselves, look at how great and wonderful he is. Do you hear that? Do you hear that? Man, I was presented this challenge early on in life to go and plant a church in what most people thought was an impossible place. And they kept bringing up the difficulty of the job or the assignment. And I kept saying, stop looking at the difficulty of the road and look to the greatness of Christ. He is greater. He is greater than any appetite that we have. He is greater than any need that we have. He is greater than any want that we could possibly have. And he calls upon us to leave the things of man and pursue the things of God. How does that happen? 
Well, the first thing is we have to realize that this is a command. This is not a suggestion. This is not a joke. When Jesus says for us to deny ourselves, he's not kidding around. This is a command, and the question is, what currently is in our lives that we've allowed to take precedent over him? What is it right now that if the Lord Jesus right now said, this is what I want you to give up, just as he came to the rich young ruler, this is what I want you to give up, would we be more in love with our things and our wants and our desires than him? Now I'm about to be pastoral for just a moment. I'm about to be plain speech for just a moment. And we're going to talk about one of the things we love to hold back from the Lord. And it's called money. Now, remember, the offering's already been taken up, so you cannot accuse me of anything. You know what I'm saying? Well, we're going to be all honest for just a moment. Giving is an indication of God's ownership. And I want you to think about, are you honoring the Lord in giving? He owns it all. And this is not just a message for non-givers. How many of you are like me and we're tithing out of our abundance, but we're not actually sacrificing anything? The Lord owns it all. Are we honoring him? Are we denying ourselves? Are we stop buying and trying to fill our lives with stuff which fade, which you cannot take with you anyway? And are we investing in the kingdom of God? There are many of you in this room, you are not giving anything. There's some of you in this room, you're tipping God. And God is saying, do you love me? Are you going to honor me? Are you going to follow me? The first part of that is to deny ourselves. That's just the area of money. What is it in other areas of our life? Is there some type of comfort? Is there some kind of joy? Is there some kind of thing that has gotten in the way of your loyalty to him? He is calling upon full loyalty, full allegiance. What is it that right now, right now in your heart, you are either convicted or you are angry with me right now? What is it that's residing in your heart? They're saying, no way, God, are you getting that? That belongs to me. And the Lord is saying, nothing belongs to you. It all belongs to him. Are we honoring to him? Deny himself and take up his cross. What does that mean? Let me begin with another quote from Bonhoeffer. The cross is laid on every Christian. The first Christ suffering which every man must experience is the call to abandon the attachments of this world. It is that dying of the old man which is the result of his encounter with Christ. Here's the key. Don't miss this. The cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life. But it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. This is a full surrender to Christ. Take up your cross. Take up that which is unlovely and difficult. What was the cross representing? Why did Peter rebuke Jesus in the first place? Because it talked about suffering. He talked about rejection. He talked about death. Three things none of us in this world value. And he's talking about them. They're necessary. And he's calling upon us to follow him, to take up our cross and follow him. What does that mean? The cross, ultimately, that's the mission of God. That's his rescue mission. That's his payment price. Now, none of us in this room, none of us could have a payment price like that. Why? Because we're sinful. He is sinless. But he calls upon us now to engage in his mission, to be a proclaimer of Christ, no matter our lot in life. I saw it this week. I saw it this week as I walked into a hospital room. And I walked into a situation where no one wants to be in. And in that hospital room, this lady is proclaiming Jesus. And she says, and I quote, 
if this is what God had to do to allow me to be in this place at this moment to proclaim and share him, all glory to Jesus. That's taking up our cross. No matter where we are, no matter what takes place, our eyes are upon Jesus. And we're surrendered to his will. We are surrendered to his call. And we are ready to respond at a moment's notice. Why? Because our lives have been changed. We are no longer the same. We are a new creation. And according to 2 Chronicles, remember, remember 2 Corinthians. Remember that passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That in verse 17, we're called a new creation. Verse number 18, that new creation is engaging in what? A ministry of reconciliation. That we are called upon to be ambassadors for Christ. That we are to share Christ as a new believer, a new creation. We are to share Him. And A.W. Tozer just sums up what it looks like to be crucified and to take up your cross with this. I love this. People who are crucified with Christ have three distinct marks. Are you ready? They are facing only one direction. They can never turn back. And they no longer have plans of their own. Think about that position on the cross. You're facing only one direction. There's no turning back. And you no longer have any plans of your own because you're focused on Jesus and what he wants to do in your life. There are two reactions to that right now. There's some of you who look at that and you go, no, thank you. And there's some of you who are saying, I'm free I'm free in Christ. I'm free in him. I've been freed. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I am free to him. And my life is his. I've been bought with a price according to God's word. And what an honor it is now to serve him, to give to him, to worship him. Because it is all summed up with a very final phrase, follow me. That very final phrase, follow me. That was the call to the disciples. The first call to Peter. The last call to Peter. Follow me. And you know one of the keys. What's the key to that? It's the union with Christ. That's what the word, the Greek word describes. First and foremost is his union with Christ as a disciple. Hear me very clearly. None of this can be done on our own. It can't be done in our own power. It's done in and through him. He walks with us. He empowers us. He changes us. You can't do it on your own. You can't turn it over on your own. You can't take up your cross on your own. But he walks with us. He empowers us. And he reveals himself to us. And I want you to see what you get. And I want you to see what it's worth. Take a look in the scriptures. Take a look at the last couple of verses, beginning in verse number 35. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. This is Jesus' unique way of saying, if you live for yourself and this world, you lose. If you surrender to me, follow me, you get eternal life. You get saved. You get rescued. Look what it's worth. For what does a man profit? What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what can a man give in return for his life? You get salvation. What's it worth? It's worth more than anything that this world has to offer combined. It's of eternal worth. And then he asked that question, what can you give in exchange for your soul? No one, not the richest man who's ever lived in this, in this world, has enough to offer for his soul. Your soul is eternal. He paid an eternal price. And only eternity is found in Jesus. And he calls upon us to understand what we get and understand its worth. And then it ends with a warning and a promise. For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation... Of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. That begins with a warning. If we do not surrender to him and follow him, we will be rejected in his eternal kingdom. And instead of being with him in his heavenly place, we will be cast into a place called hell and torment for eternity. 
That's the warning. The promise is, is that when we do follow him, he will proclaim us. He will accept us into his kingdom. We will get to rejoice and revel in his glory, not just for a day, but forever. And the time is short. Today, after all these services this morning, I have to officiate a funeral for a longtime member of our church. Death is a reminder that every one of us in this room in 50 to 75 years will no longer be here. This life is a vapor in this life. We were made for eternity. Do you know Jesus? Have you responded to him? Are you living for him? Have you denied yourself? Have you taken up your cross? Are you following Jesus? This is when Jesus draws a line in the sand and you've got to say either I'm for him or I'm against him. That's what's standing in front of you right now. Not my words. This is the word of God. Do you know him? And are you ready to respond? Pray with me this morning. Lord Jesus, we come to you. And Lord, your word just cuts us to the heart. With all heads bowed and eyes closed. Do you know him? Do you know him? That's the first question you have to ask. Have I surrendered my life to you, Jesus? Have I responded to your invitation? Because the Lord Jesus has paid your price and he is with open arms welcoming you into his kingdom. And the scripture is really clear. Man, if we confess with our mouths Jesus the Lord and believe in our hearts that he's been raised from the dead, the scripture says we will be saved. Not about our effort, it's about what he has done. Will you respond to him this morning? Those of us who are calling Jesus Lord with our mouths, are we following him with our lives? Is there something that we've been holding back? Is there something we've been wrestling with? Is there something we've been refusing to turn over? The Lord is calling us to follow him this morning. Lord Jesus, give us the strength this morning to respond, not to hold back, to get out of our seat, to get up here, to pray, to lay it down. Father, to worship you fully and completely. Give us the strength and the courage this morning. We pray for this in the name of Jesus. Amen.